and then uh, we will um, have some time there so that uh, you can uh, chat. So we've been, I know it's been a lot of information coming at you. So um, hopefully you will stay and join us for that. Thank you. It is my pleasure to um, kick off the last session of today, uh, give you a preview of the American River Basin Stormwater Resource Plan. It's uh, just been released for the yesterday. Comments will be due March 30th. At the end of my presentation, I've got um, links of where you can access the public draft and get comments and who to get comments to, namely me. Um, this project or development of the project was partially funded by a grant from the State Water Resources Control Board's Stormwater Grant Program through Proposition 1. Uh, there's a 50% grant and we have a lot of stakeholders, something like 22 agencies, 44 individuals who've been contributing in-kind services towards that match. So um, I want to give them so much thanks and credit for their uh, assistance on that. And uh, when um, we were putting the program together for today, we were going back and forth on whether or not to include the storm talk at the beginning or at the end or when. And I'm glad we settled on it at this time because everything you've heard about so far sets me up really, really good. So I'm going to go kind of quick. The overall uh, um, overview for today, um, I am come from a, a house of a civil engineer as a dad and a second grade teacher as a mom. So I'm really into clarification, giving clarification. So I'm just gonna give a little more detail to get you thinking again about the terms of the purpose and um, the, the purpose and possibilities of the intent for the stormwater resource plans, relevant specifics for the ARB region, how we put the framework and the methodology together and then kind of schedule and how you can get involved. So as Beth said before, if you have a capture and use project that you want to um, be eligible for state funding, that project has to be in a stormwater resource plan. Um, the stormwater resource plan will outline methods for developing and implementing capture and use projects to other regional management efforts, and that's to achieve multiple benefits. The plan describes how to quantify those benefits so that they, they can be used to assess performance and adaptively manage the plan. There's a few phrases I want to clarify regarding this. So, and you've heard these phrases all through today, but I thought it was important that we should kind of take a stick up the bottom again. So, what are we trying to integrate? What is capture and use? What benefits are we trying to achieve? So, I thought, let's go to the dictionary um, per Miriam Webster. These are my friends, ducks, Miriam and Webster. I thought it was a cute visual for the slide. No relation to the definition, but to form, coordinate, or blend, or maybe they are, a uh, functioning or unified whole. Okay, so that indicates that there's something existing, some kind of programs that are already there, they're going to be work that we have to work with. And sure enough, there are. There's services for water delivery and wastewater treatment. There's programs for reducing flood risk. There's municipal capital improvement projects, shape future development. There's NPDES programs that protect and restore human and ecological benefits. And the watershed stewardship groups that work to enhance and protect ecological function. And um, there's actually, like we've heard about earlier, there's a mechanism for integrating all those things already. We have the integrated regional water management plans. And so how does stormwater fit in or the stormwater resource plans fit in? Well, they really emphasize that stormwater as a resource component to merge that into the integrated planning. Okay, so the next phrase I want to clarify is capture and use. Forms as part of one of their projects is uh, um, identifying and addressing barriers for capture and use. And for part of that project, they've developed a tentative definition. I think it's still come under um, going under approval, but it's essentially looking at augment surface water supplies, recharge groundwater, and then support ecosystems. And so in the, maybe in the example, the most simple form for augmenting surface water supplies would be residential rain barrels. And you can argue whether or not they're really practical for the Sacramento area, but they're a you know, possibility, feel good, good possibility. You could also do something more of like a regional larger scale capture into cisterns like they do in, uh, in Melbourne and use that for, say, irrigation of parkland. Um, there's a lot of options for recharging groundwater. There's doing surface infiltration through like bioretention, or you could do field crop, crop field flooding. You could use dry wells for deeper infiltration. Um, or you could even do like in lieu recharge or conjunctive use where you're bringing in surface water infrastructure to communities that are dependent on supplies, thereby during high water flows, you can give them surface water, saving groundwater for other periods like drought. 
And then finally, we should not forget um, how the, that um, we can capture and use to supply ecosystems for the, um, the needs and interests of our um, original residents. So the final phrase I want to use to I want to help orient us through stormwater resource plans is multiple benefits, and that comes to down to um, those five categories you've heard a lot today. Um, they tie right into those services we were talking about: augment water supply, improve water quality, control, protect and restore environmental systems, and enhance communities. So keep all those in mind as we as we move forward. Okay, let's take a look at the ARB region. And the specifics, the region was defined by the, by the IRWIMP uh, when it was being developed. It includes Sacramento County, Western Placer County, El Dorado County. We are in an area where there's usually a good amount of water relative to other areas of the state. There's three relevant NPDS permits. There's about 75 303D listings, 16 DMDLs, a straight-wide trash policy. There's eight HUC-8 watersheds. Um, and lots of other numbers to cite regarding forest projects, water bodies, groundwater basins, rainfall amounts. And the really take home points of that are many stakeholders, many issues, many priorities, and from that, many opportunities. Putting a positive spin on it. Okay, so how do um, project stormwater resource plan projects, how could they provide benefits? Well, you've got LID as a key tool, especially through infiltration in the recharge projects, can augment water supply, stormwater resource plan projects that include flooding of agricultural areas and other fields can promote infiltration and the recharge of groundwater supplies. Uh, another example would be SAC, or, um, SAC re, excuse me, Regional SAN, Sacramento Regional County Sanitation District is looking at projects as part of their South County Ag project. And they're going to be taking recycled water and they want, to inf they want to infiltrate it to recharge groundwater. Well, they need a four to one ratio dilution for that. So they're looking at using stormwater as their dilutant water. So another kind of creative way for using stormwater. Um, there's in lieu recharge conductive use I mentioned, the field flooding um, that Kasumnus River is looking at. Um, Kasumnus Coalition is looking at, and then the dilutant water. Um, so, okay, the framework for the stormwater resource plan, um, the opportunity about, they're already outlined in the IRWIMP, and so it serves as a great backbone for the stormwater resource plan framework. It's managed by the Regional Water Authority. They've been a prime component in putting our stormwater resource plan together um, under through the development. They have defined regional goals and objectives. Um, they include multi-benefit projects. And, um, have an online planning tool information center. I think we maybe talked about that today or not, um, but you'll see a little bit of it more later. But we've, we've, we have all those existing pieces or elements to tie into already. Um, so it turns out that the, um, the goals from the, from the IRWIMP, if you look tie exactly to the multi-benefits that we're trying to achieve through stormwater as a resource. So we adopted those same goals in a little simpler terminology. Increase, increase water supply, reduce flood risk, improve water quality, protect the environment, enhance communities. And then they've got the objectives too that fit in really nicely with stormwater resource. Uh, things like improvability to reliably meet water demands, improve protection of beneficial uses, maintain and improve ecosystem function. So um, this is a, a screenshot of the IRWIMP's Opti online planning tool. And uh, it, it proponents, it's been updated water resource plans. So proponents of plans of projects can actually go in, they'd input all the standard information you would for an IRWIMP project, like the title, the location, a description, lead agency, the expected benefits. We put in new features that allow the user to indicate if the project's gonna be part of the stormwater resource plan. And if it does, it tab, you answer a couple more questions that get into kind of the prioritization specific to stormwater resource plan projects. Okay, so one more important thing to make regarding the framework, like the IRWIMP, the stormwater resource plan, pulls from existing programs like we talked about earlier for integrating. Great sources for stormwater resource plan projects, but there's a lot of recent activities They'll influence regional planning. There's 19 groundwater sustainability agencies that have recently formed and they're developing groundwater management plans. 
The State Water Board is addressing barriers to capture and use, such as the development of dry well guidance we heard this morning. Valley Regional Board issued the phase, a new Phase 1 NPDES permit in 2015, and the Sacramento um, Stormwater Quality Partnership is working on, a, a, on their um, alternative compliance pathway and reasonable assurance assessment approach um, to comply with that. The Phase 1 and Phase 2 NPDES permit programs for the statewide trash policy and the IRWIMP is being updated. So lots of moving parts, and that'll influence the adaptive management of the plan. And uh, kind of emphasizes, again, the um, probably that's a really good thing that it's a living document. OK, so now we're ready to get into the details of the stormwater resource plan. Um, we've reached out to stakeholders to inform them of our effort. Um, we've done monthly planning meetings. We've sent out letters and notifications. We're having the conference today. Thanks for coming. And then there's the opting. The, um, the, we've defined the benefits and the metrics. Um, they're, again, those five kind of multiple benefit categories, and they're specific in there. And for each one of those, we said how you can go about calculating these benefits, specific if you're going to use an LID type project. And so those are all listed in appendix in the stormwater resource plan. And we pulled from different design manuals and design tools like the Sacramento Area Hydrologic Tool, the, um, the phase two LID sizing tool, things like that, that are locally available. So like I said, there's all kinds of existing resources, existing programs that will go into stormwater decks. We uh, felt it um, useful to put together a couple of new tools. One is the ARB web map that um, that Eric showcased a little bit. It's available on the OWP website. Another thing we did is put together a project opportunity matrix that lists all those different kind of site features and then site conditions that would serve as kind of for how good of a project could this be. And you put all these different considerations in, could it be, this would be like an ideal LID project, or this would be an ideal site for, um, for restoration, or this would be an ideal site for a dry well, things like that. So the, uh, the prioritization scheme we came up with mimics the ERG at the number of benefits. Are the ben benefits quantified and how implementable is your project? And it comes into kind of this tiered system. And I'm out of time, so I'm not going to go into more detail than that, I guess. Okay, again, it's a living document. Um, the stakeholders plan, design, implement projects. We've got Opti for posting and tracking. Lovely managed, right? We heard about that. But... Um, there's a couple of ways you can do performance assessments. And again, because we have all those stakeholders, all those needs, all those interests in the region, we came up with a couple of methods. One is to look at those benefits that you've quantified and over so many years, let's add them up and see how we've done. Simplest of them all. You could do some of the modeled benefits um, or maybe something like the Green Planet tool. Um, you could also do environmental indicators and the presentation coming up uh, next is you're going to hear more on that. Um, and then uh, we'll be updating the tool based on the needs and funding. So what's next? Uh, we're currently expect accepting projects. The plan is going to be final up our date of May 25th. So if you have a project, you can submit it to me by April 30th as the deadline. You'll put a project summary together. Um, if you're interested in, um, in um, reviewing the public draft, you have um, my contact information up there, and we're also going to be posting on our OWP website very soon. And thank you to all again to um, all of our stakeholders and collaborating agencies. Any questions? You sure? Wow! Wow! She answered them all. Oh, do we have one? No. Okay. Next presentation. The next presentation has uh, two speakers, but uh, we're going to have Barbara is going to be uh, speaking, and uh, Greg will be available for questions. Great. Okay. Um, so uh, I guess in, in planning this conference, a number of uh, the planners thought that it might be worth taking five minutes or so to address the question of how are the ecosystem benefits be? What are some alternative ways that they might be measured that are, um, as Maureen alluded to, environmental indicators? 
So what is an environmental or watershed indicator? This is a sort of a textbook definition. Environmental indicators are measurements that track environmental conditions. You can measure the condition at a particular date, and then hopefully you can continue to, tr to gather data so you can see a trend over time, which will really give you meaningful information. They help to improve our understanding of the environment and how human activities, as well as natural disturbances, can influence, and they can be used to gauge progress towards a goal. So why are indicators useful? Um, Typically, uh, the best indicators are ones that are simple metrics that have a significance beyond the measurement themselves. So the best example I always think of is depth, sucky disk depth, a measurement of clarity in Lake Tahoe that has, has been used for decades. And it's a good example because it will measure, as it's a very simple measurement, it's easy to understand what's happening, yet it reflects a lot that's going on in the environment. It sediment runoff from the surrounding area, in the case of Lake Tahoe, let's say, it reflects nutrient runoff, which then affects eutrophication, causing reduced de secchi disk depth. And that then depletes oxygen and has all kinds of ramifications for the ecosystem within Lake Tahoe. So that always thought of that as the model environmental indicator. It's not always that easy to find such simple metrics that have such significance. Um, why are these indicators useful? Because they uh, can they can be non-technical and a way to communicate to the public. Uh, somewhat comp, uh, they show a relationship between practice and conditions, and they focus the discussion on how changing management can achieve the desired condition. And I think the key there is really changing management. How practices that we are, we can't have, well, I wouldn't say totally we don't affect, there, there's there of natural disturbances that we do have influence on, but um, in many cases we don't influence it. But with the management practices, especially stormwater management practices, we, we can influence those and um, it, Environmental indicators help to give us a sense of are our practice successful or perhaps not so successful. So the commonly used metrics that I think so many of us are used to referring to are, are things such as that I've listed here. The number of downloaded reports. That shows that a lot of people are interested in whatever the report that you, uh, uh, the number of monitoring events or the number of projects that were completed. And these, these um, may not tell us if the management regime, regimes that we're using are contributing to an improvement in watershed conditions and health. In contrast, environmental index, environmentally meaningful consequences of these activities. So here's just one or two examples. This was drawn from a report on the Dry Creek watershed that had four years of data on um, Five minutes. Okay. Excuse me. I have to turn around. Four years of data on um, uh, in-stream cover, also known as epifaunal substrate, things like rocks, logs, undercut banks, etc., that provide really important habitat for uh, for fish, for um, benthic. Uh, it's a great place for fish to hide, to rest, to get out of the out of the current, to hunt from, etc. And um, on the graph here, you can see there's in-stream cover score on the x-axis and the sensitive taxa, the richness of that taxa, the number of these taxa. And you can see that there's a relationship here between in-stream cover and EPT taxa. And there are causal relationships. Maybe I should go back to this one here. There are, this, in the upper right here, this data was drawn from a site which was acted by uh, human activity. And the, this on the bottom left were, was drawn from a site that was the most impacted in this water, in the Dry Creek watershed by human activity. And you can see that there's quite a bit of difference there. And the likely causal relationships are, are the key to linking up in-stream cover management practices. So if you look here, this is a, a uh, one part of a technical diagram looking at these relationships. 
pre-quarter management practices, such as allowing uh, downed logs and uh, wood to fall and stay in the stream habitat, affects in-stream cover. Likewise, stormwater BMPs are, will affect hydro modification. That will, in turn, alter the rate of bank erosion and all affect in-stream cover. So I think I'm going to skip this. This is another example of a uh, looking at canopy cover. I think somebody uh, earlier today spoke about the importance of the tree. I think it was Andy this morning and how important the functions of trees are and canopy cover, in-stream cover, they both relate to in the riparian corridor and how that affects um, the what's happening in the in the creeks and waterways and in turn the best management practices in ma terms of managing stormwater and even the space that's provided for those creek corridors uh, have a, a huge um, these metrics so how are environmentally environmental indicators useful in stormwater resources planning they can establish a baseline for key environmental metrics they provide a measure of trends for the projects and plans that we are developing. And then they can show a water resource plan is having the desired environmental effects on the aquatic ecosystem that um, really is the impetus in large part for these plans. Here's a couple of examples of indicators which may be useful. For aquatic life, I'll just read off a few of these because we're short on time. Bug metric of bugs in the creek for aquatic life, for aquatic habitat, uh, metrics of stream incision or uh, pebble count stream bed is a simple measurement and suspended sediments it would be a metric of water quality. So in conclusion, environmental indicators provide meaningful to the impact of practices and policies on watershed conditions and functions. Are there any questions? Um, the reason we had brought this up is there's a project conservancy that has data over many years that they were looking at um, with an indicators project. Got a question in the back? I looked at the construction general permit, whether that's affected um, pre and post conditions of water quality with the implementation of the 2010 um, general permit, whether any of those environmental indicators have um, changed as part of the implementation of that. Angela called 